Good afternoon, brothers and sisters. It's good to be back together for a time uh, of worship. Let us uh, begin our service and rise in the presence of our God. And once again, we confess that our help is in the name of the Lord who has made the heavens and the earth. Grace, mercy, and peace to you from God the Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Our Father, great in majesty, that will be our first song, a song of praise based on the Lord's Prayer. We sing hymn 63, stanzas 1 through 4. After that, we will remain standing to sing uh, our confession of faith with the Apostles' Creed, him one.
Let us now go to our God in a time of prayer. Almighty God, our Father who are in heaven, we praise you, O Lord. O Lord, our God, you are very great. You are clothed with splendor and majesty. You wrap yourself in light as with a garment. You stretch out the heavens like a tent and lay the beams of, you, of your upper chambers on their waters. You make the clouds your chariots and you ride on the wings of the wind. You make winds your messengers and flames of fire your servants. You have set the earth on its foundation so it cannot be moved. You covered it with the deep as with a garment and the waters stood above the mountains but at your rebuke the waters fled and at the sound of your thunder they took flight. They flowed over the mountains. They went down into the valleys to the place you assigned for them. You set a boundary they cannot cross. Never again will they cover the earth. How many are your works, O Lord, in wisdom? You made them all. The earth is full of your glory. And together with all of that world, we too look to you to give us our food at the proper time, to provide for us and to care for us. Because when you give us what we need and we are satisfied with good things, but when you hide your face, it is terrifying. And when you take away our breath and we die and return to the dust, it is only when you send your spirit that we are created, that we come to life. And you are the one who renew the face of this earth. Lord, we pray that you will continue to provide for us also today as you speak to us once again from your word. We pray that our life may be sustained by the proclamation of Jesus Christ and him crucified and risen. Give us open ears and open minds and open hearts to hear what the Spirit has to say to the churches. Lord, we pray that uh, you will bless not only this service, but also the meeting we have afterward, where we elect elders and deacons. We pray that this may be done to the glory of your holy name. We pray that you give your blessing over the other activities in this coming week. We pray that uh, on Tuesday there may be a good Breakfast for the seniors, you will be with the men's breakfast on Saturday morning, that this too may build us up. We ask, Lord, that you give your blessing not only on this church, but also in, on the federation of churches that we belong to. May throughout this region and throughout this country, your name may be praised and proclaimed clearly and in truth and in spirit. We pray especially this Sunday, Lord, for um, the college that we maintain to train ministers of the word. Give your blessing to the Canadian Reformed Theological Seminary in Hamilton, where several men are being trained. It's the end of uh, the school year, close to the end of the school year, Lord, and many are preparing for their exams. We pray that you give them your blessing we pray that you especially be with uh, those who plan on completing their study this year and then wait for your will in their life as they will be ready to receive a call. Lord, we pray that on their examinations, both at the college and in the churches, they may do well. Uh, and we thank you for the many gifts that you have given these men. We also pray that you give your blessing to the internships that many of the students will embark on this summer. Lord, we pray that you give your grace to your church worldwide, that wherever people gather in the name of Jesus Christ, his name may be honored, the truth may be proclaimed, and the kingdom of God may become visible also in the life of your church. May the glory of the Lord endure forever. May you rejoice in your works, and we will sing of your glory all our lives, O oh Lord. We will praise you as long as we live. May the meditation of our mouth be pleasing to you as we rejoice in your holy name. We pray this for Jesus' sake. 
Amen. Our first uh, scripture reading this afternoon is from Matthew chapter 6. It's the middle of uh, Jesus' sermon, known as the Sermon on the Mount. And we'll read from Matthew 6, verses 1 through 18. So hear now the words of our Lord Jesus Christ. Be careful not to do your acts of righteousness before men to be seen by them. If you do, you will have no reward from your Father in heaven. So when you give to the needy, do not announce it with trumpets, as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and on the streets, to be honored by men. I tell you the truth, they have received their reward in full. But when you give to the needy, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing, so that your giving may be in secret. Then your father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. And when you pray, do not be like the hypocrites, for they love to pray standing in the synagogues and on the street corners to be seen by men. I tell you the truth, they have received their reward in full. But when you pray, go into your room, close the door and pray to your father who is unseen And your father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. And when you pray, do not keep on babbling like pagans. For they think they will be hurt because of their many words. Do not be like them. For your father knows what you need before you ask him. This then is how you should pray. Our father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For if you forgive men when they sin against you, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive men their sins, your Father will not forgive your sins. And when you fast... Do not look somber, as the hypocrites do, for they disfigure their faces to show men that they are fasting. I tell you the truth, they have received their reward in full. But when you fast, put oil on your head and wash your face so that it will not be obvious to men that you are fasting, but only to your Father who is unseen. And your Father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. Let us sing praise to our God who is our Father from Psalm 103, stanzas 4, 5, and 8. Let's rise to sing.
In the Catechism, we continue our study of Christian prayer, and we are up to Lord's Day 46, page 560 of your book of praise. Lord's Day 46, two questions and answers. Why has Christ commanded us to address God as our Father? To awaken in us, as the very beginning of our prayer, that childlike reference and trust toward God, which should be basic to our prayer. God has become our Father through Christ, and will much less deny us what we ask of him in faith than our fathers would refuse us earthly things. Why is there added in heaven? These words teach us not to think of God's heavenly majesty in an earthly manner, and to expect from his almighty power all things we need for body and soul. Congregation of our Lord Jesus Christ, brothers and sisters, in the previous sermon on the Catechism two weeks ago, we discussed the basic principles of Christian prayer. It is prayer to God the Father in the name of Jesus Christ through the Holy Spirit. And the Catechism told us that we should pray to the one true God with a humble understanding of our needs and in the confidence of faith that he will hear us. Today we continue our study of prayer and we will think especially about the mystery and the privilege of prayer as a communication from earthly people who are unholy in themselves to the great and holy God in heaven. If we really understand what prayer is, we are aware that it would be naturally impossible to really pray. And yet, by the grace of God, it is not only possible, but it is an activity to which we are invited and which we are urged to do frequently as a central part of our life of worship. The theme for the sermon this afternoon is the privilege of Christian prayer. We will first see a child asking his or her father. Second, the earth crying to heaven. And third, the church submitting to her Lord. In our reading in Matthew 6, we heard Jesus teach about prayer as one of the three important religious activities. The other two were charitable giving and fasting. Now that chapter we read, Matthew 6, is part of the Sermon on the Mount, and that is often considered the heart of Jesus' uh, teaching. Some have called these three chapters, Matthew 5 through 7, the constitution of the kingdom of God. And that's a good way to think about it. This is where Jesus laid out the program of his mission and ministry. So clearly, Jesus thought it very important for his followers to pray. And we, as his followers, we ask, so what did he pray? What did he teach about prayer? Well, negatively, the Lord Jesus criticized prayers that become big shows. The main point in chapter 6 in our reading is that we are not religious for the sake of the people around us, but for the sake of our God. In his radical preaching, the Lord suggested that it is better to do these things secretly, in the broom closet, if necessary, uh, rather than as an attempt to impress others. There's a choice to make. Do you give and pray and fast to receive praise from people? Or do you do those things to show respect to God? Who do you want to reward you? The people when they ooh and ah about how religious you are? Or your Father in heaven who can see even in that broom closet and reward you in an invisible way? Positively, Jesus taught his disciples to pray a simple prayer. There are no long introductory formulas. There's no big theological language. 
even the doxology of the Lord's Prayer, for yours is the kingdom and the glory and the power forever, even that appears not to have been part of the original teaching. Maybe you were missing it when we read that chapter. It's not in the original manuscripts of the Bible, it seems. What the Lord gave his disciples to pray were six short prayer items, six petitions, as we call them, six things that we really need. That's it. And these six petitions, they're nothing new in themselves. The Old Testament people of God also prayed for God's kingdom and for his glory, for their daily bread and for forgiveness. But there's one thing that Jesus taught his disciples and that he teaches us that is uniquely new for the church of the New Testament. The Jews were accustomed, and still are, to address God in their prayers as Lord with many majestic titles, such as Lord God of our fathers, Lord the Holy God, Lord Redeemer of Israel, and so on. But our Lord Jesus tells us, when you pray, say, Father, our Father who are in heaven. And that, more than anything, teaches us something about prayer and about praying in general. It reveals a deep miracle. As the Catechism points out in question and answer 120, at the very beginning of our prayer, the Lord wants to awaken in us the right attitude toward God, which should be basic to our prayer. From petition one through petition six, in all that we lay before him in prayer, we should understand and appreciate what is really happening when we pray. It is not just that the human being cries out to God. It is not just that covenant people respond to God's call by calling back to him. Those things are all true, of course. But when we as followers of Jesus pray, we may and we must do this with a richer understanding of the relationship within which we raise our prayers. We pray to Father. Now, of course, we are very familiar with the word Father in a theological context. Father is the title of God, and especially of the first person of the Trinity. And we just sang it, I believe in God the Father, Almighty, Creator of heaven and earth. Is that the, maybe even the definition of God the Father? But Father is not just a label that we use for this divine person to distinguish him from the other two persons, the Son and the Holy Spirit. The word Father, of course, means something. It is a concept well known from earthly life, and God encourages us to invoke this concept when we think of him, when we talk to him, when we pray to him. And so the question is, what does it say about our relationship with God when we call him Father? What do you think of when you hear the word Father? What are your expectations of someone who you call Father? Now, to be sure, different people react to the word Father in different ways. And sadly, for some people, Father is a painful word. Some people find it hard to think of God as a father based on their experience with fathers in the world and especially with their own. There are too many abusive fathers and absent fathers. Here on earth, we as fathers are certainly not perfect. But I think we all recognize, whether we have experienced it or not, that there is an ideal that there is an idea of what the perfect father would and should look like. And what is that? Well, father means provision and security. Father means strong and able to protect. Father means someone who looks after you. Father means someone who teaches you about life and work and who one day will pass what is his unto you, his child. Father means someone you aspire to be like and who will help you accomplish that. Father means someone who listens, who cares, someone who loves you. 
Jesus taught us to think of God and to speak to God as to a father. And not just any father, but to the perfect a father. And that beautiful, comforting concept of father is the best earthly concept that we have, that God has given us to explain who he is to us and what kind of relationship it is within which we pray. Now, sometimes when we talk about worship, we make an analogy with royalty. You wouldn't wear that when you, if you were visiting the king, would you? Parents have often said to kids on Sunday mornings. Now, there is an important way in which our worship should be infused with the sense of God's holiness and therefore with deeply respectful attitude. And then you can think of the picture of a king that you're going to visit. Um, but that is not the first thing that Jesus teaches us. He says, when you pray, say, Father. It is true that God is a mighty king, but to us, he is first of all Father. So let me amend the analogy a bit. We are like the little prince or princess who may fly into the state room and jump right onto the lap of the majestic king and bury our face into his royal chest and cry, Father, Father, I've messed up again. I dropped that antique vase and now it's broken. Can you help me, please? No one in the palace gets to do that. But the little prince and princess, yes. God as our Father. That should fill our prayers with great confidence. Jesus pointed out that even your average father generally can be trusted to care for his children in Matthew 7. He says, well, if you ask your father for food, so you ask for a little loaf of bread, he's not going to give you a boulder instead. No father <laughs> really does that. But if average, imperfect, earthly fathers give their children what they need, how much more do you think the father can be trusted to give us all that we need because he loves us? As the Catechism says, he will much less deny us what we ask of him in faith than our, our fathers would refuse us earthly things. Here's what we call an a fortiori reasoning. If this is already true for the imperfect earthly father, how much more, how much more do you think is it true for the heavenly father who is perfect? God as our father, that is not just a nice metaphor to psych us up, to feel confident and comforted when we say our prayers. This is a reality. This is a miracle, yes, but it is also truth that the great God of heaven and earth is our loving Father in every way that matters. Now, how is that possible? The Catechism explained, God has become our Father through Christ. And this echoes the wonderful biblical revelation and teaching of what we call adoption, of sonship. Right? You know what adoption means? means that someone who is not naturally your child, you take into your home and you treat him exactly like your child. He becomes your child. And that the Bible teaches us about God and us. You find this especially proclaimed in Romans 8, verse 14 and following. If you have received the Holy Spirit of God, then he turns you into a son or daughter of God. And then that Holy Spirit will also teach you to pray, and especially to pray to God as our Abba, our Father, who with everything that it means. So that is the wonderful, intimate reality of Christian prayer. The fact that God is our Father and that we are his children shortens the distance of our prayer so that they become direct and they become prayers full of trust. But let us not forget that this is a great miracle, a great mystery of our Christian faith. And this brings us to a second point. 
understanding the amazing truth that God is our Father should not make us in any way think small of God. The heavenly Abba is not an earthly daddy. Following the catechism, there are two ways in which we should be careful to acknowledge and admire the greatness of our Father. The first way in which we can think too small of God is when we treat him as part of our realm of naturally belonging in here with who and what and where we are. When we pray, we can make this mistake by forgetting the wonder of us as earthly creatures communicating with the Lord in heaven. The contrast, heaven versus earth, is profound and it is an absolute. We are made of earthly stuff, we are material, we are bound in physical space, but the God to whom we pray, he is spirit, he is unlimited, he is not of this world. But there is an even more decisive difference that should stop us short in our tracks if we are ever tempted to take prayer for granted. Currently, this earthly realm is out of line with God's perfection. It's characterized by wickedness. It is placed under a curse. And that includes us who carry guilt and often harbor sin in our hearts. In short, we are unholy. And, but on the other hand, the Lord God, he is holy, 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 infinite perfection, not a hint of darkness, always true, always good, always blessed. And we do well to listen to the accounts of God's people who encountered God in his holiness. Think of Moses at the burning bush who quickly took off his sandals. Think of Isaiah in his vision of heaven when he cried out, Woe to me, I am a man of unclean lips. Think of disciple Peter who recognized Christ as the Lord and fell down in front of Jesus and said, Go away from me, Lord, I am a sinful man. None of these men of faith would ever dare to, to treat God as their equal or as their buddy or, as some popular bumper stickers suggest, as their co-pilot. Abraham was God's friend, and we are Abraham's children, but neither he nor we should ever presume to approach God without being impressed by his great holiness. And the Bible is full of warnings about this. Think of priests Nadab and Abihu, who worshipped in a less than meticulous way and were struck down. Think of Uzzah, who well-meaningly but thoughtlessly tried to straighten out the ark on that cart, and he died. In the New Testament, Hebrews 12, a chapter that encourages us by saying that we have direct access to the heavenly Jerusalem, also warns us, our God is a consuming fire. Compared to that, the language of our catechism is, is mild and patient. When we call God our Father in heaven, says the catechism, these words, these words teach us not to think of God's heavenly majesty in an earthly manner. That's, that's a gentle way of saying it. Let's make sure not to ignore it. A second way in which we may think too small of God is when we pray with low expectations. As if he were a well-intentioned father who, alas, is limited in what he can do. I know you mean well, God, but I'm not sure you can do this or that. But remember, the father to whom we pray is God the Father, almighty creator of heaven and earth, of all things, visible and invisible, Already in Lord's Day 9, we confessed, In him I trust so completely as to have no doubt that he will provide me with all things necessary for body and soul and will also turn to my good whatever adversity he sends me in this life of sorrow. He is able to do so as Almighty God and also willing as a faithful father. Do we really believe this? Do we really believe that God can do all things and does that then translate into our prayers? For instance, if the doctors have told us they've tried and they cannot heal us, 
Do we stop asking the Lord for healing? There's a tendency to do that. The doctors have spoken. This cancer is incurable. That's the end. Do we ask the Lord for healing, knowing that he can work miracles? That then the doctor says, it can't be done. The Lord says, but I can. And then if, if it doesn't happen, the way we ask, do we think of God as sadly being unable to do it? Or do we acknowledge the difficult truth that in his wisdom he decided to leave us, for instance, in our sickness? That he is also the one who allows this adversity to continue in my life. If we have a sufficiently big view of our Father as the one who is in heaven with majestic power beyond anyone else, then our prayers will be full of expectation. Then we will, as the Catechism says, expect from his almighty power all things we need for body and soul. And so on one hand, when we pray from the earth, we should be aware just how far we are from heaven. It's a divine miracle that our cries and pleas from the unholy ground reach the ear of the holy God in his heavenly throne room. Absolute miracle. On the other hand, if we believe that our prayers are indeed heard by his heavenly majesty, then it would be foolish to doubt that he can fulfill our prayers or to leave anything out of our prayer because we decide it's probably asking a little too much of God. Let us pray with, with great reverence, but also with great expectation. Now there's one point that the catechism doesn't address here, but I want to quick um, point this out. We, we don't just pray to Father in heaven, we say our Father in heaven. And that little word our must not be overlooked. First of all, the intimate understanding of God as Father is not for everyone. Our adoption as children of God is a gift of salvation. And we have to be humble and realize we are not natural children of God. We are not naturally children of God. We are his children only for Jesus' sake through faith in him. Now there's a strand of uh, liberal theology that popularized speaking of, say, the universal fatherhood of God and the universal brotherhood of, of man. And the idea that, in a general way, God is the father of everyone. But that flattens what the word father in the Bible means. Now, we may approach God as our father only if we belong, belong to Jesus Christ in faith. And therefore, we know that we have been adopted as children of God. But if we do that in faith, then the fact of him being our father means the world to us. Or rather, it means having free access to heaven. It means having the deepest love of God and inheriting the treasures of heaven. So by praying our father, we acknowledge the great privilege that not everyone has, but that we have been made worthy of to be the children of God. Second, when we say our Father, we emphasize that we pray as people who belong to the kingdom of heaven. We specifically pray in the name of Jesus. We also specifically pray as followers of Jesus. Remember Jesus said to his disciples, this is how others pray, but when you, my followers, pray, this is how. This is a privilege for you because you are my followers. We join our voice with the prayers of the worldwide church and we honor Jesus Christ as the Lord of the church. Also when we pray, 
We pray as those who have joined the mission of Jesus Christ, who have been enlisted in his army, if you will, to proclaim salvation to the whole world and prepare for the new world of peace. We don't pray as random people. We pray as witnesses of Christ. So saying our Father expresses that our priorities are the priorities of God's kingdom and that the requests we pray are driven by the concerns of that kingdom. And third, when we say our Father, and then we continue to pray in that first person plural, give us our daily bread and lead us not into temptation, then that teaches us to pray for other Christians as well. The Lord is my Father, but he is also yours and yours. He loves me, but he also loves you. And that makes you my brother and my sister. And I care for you as well, for the Lord's sake. And so my prayer for what I need for body and soul also becomes a prayer for what my brothers and sisters need. Give us, Lord, what we need. And forgive us our debts. And lead us not into temptation. And you see, by including that little word, our, the Lord Jesus reminds us that our prayers ought not to be selfish, but that we should also, and especially, pray for one another. And so to conclude, the Lord Jesus sets us off to a beautiful start when he taught us to pray, our Father who are in heaven. We may pray to God with the confidence of children, the reverence of worshipers, with the expectation of people who know his love and his power, and in communion with King Jesus and his church. And brothers and sisters, if that is how we pray, I am certain that we will find much blessing from the Father who hears us, for Jesus' sake. Shall we pray? Father in heaven, what a wonderful word it is that we may use to address you. Our Father, you are. You have counted us worthy for the sake of your own grace and for the sake of Jesus Christ our Lord to be the children of the King. You have promised us the riches of heaven and you give us now already all that we need, and especially you give us your love. And so we pray, Lord, that we may take up our role as your children and do so in confidence and with the amazement of faith so that we come to you and, and talk to you often, that we lay before you all our concerns and ask you for all things that we need with a childlike trust. Help us, Lord, not to think small of you. Help us to be reverent yet confident in our prayers. Help us to be bold to ask whatever we need and yet mindful of the priority that your kingdom is in our lives. And Lord, as we pray for the things that we need, help us especially to first seek the kingdom and its righteousness, knowing that all the other things you will provide for. Lord, we ask that you be with those especially who have difficulty praying, maybe because they are angry at you, they're frustrated, they think that you don't hear or that you don't care. Teach us to overcome obstacles like that by growing our faith. Lord, also help us to overcome laziness as we sometimes don't pray as much as we ought to, maybe hardly pray at all. Lord, teach us the beauty of doing this and how much comfort it gives us as well. And then also teach us to pray for one another. Make us mindful of the needs of our brothers and sisters so that we also lift them up to prayer in the name of Christ, who is both our Lord and their Lord. And so we pray, as the disciples said 2,000 years ago, Lord, teach us 
to pray. We ask this all for Jesus Christ, our Savior's sake. Amen. We continue our singing in hymn 63, uh, the Lord's Prayer rhymed. Hymn 63 stands as 5, 6, and 7. And let's rise to sing. Let us now give our gifts for the needy as the deacons will distribute it to those in need. Um, after the collection for the needy, we will rise to sing our doxology, which is the doxology of the Lord's Prayer, stanza 8 of hymn 63.
I'd like to remind you that after the service, we have a congregational meeting for the election of office wear, so please uh, stay around. Uh, it will be a few minutes, and we'll start our meeting after this service. Receive now the blessing of our triune God. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen. <laughs>